<laughs> Good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, February the 12th, 2024, at 7 p.m. here at Downers Grove's Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Ellis is absent. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchek. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in that basket over there to my right. I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, we're going to start, as we always do, with our Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd like to welcome up the uh, student council from Whittier School. All right, tonight before we get into our regular board business, um, I'm very excited because normally I don't get to do this. Normally Dr. Russell gets to uh, talk about uh, and honor individuals in our educational community that have done something amazing. Uh, but tonight it's my turn. Um, I really would like to take this opportunity to talk about Dr. Kevin Russell, the gentleman next to me. As many of you are aware, our superintendent was named the 2024 Superintendent of Distinction by his peers in DuPage County Region for the Illinois Association of School Administrators. Kevin, your dedication to the excellence in education has been evident throughout your career, which now spans 24 years. And I'm not gonna lie, that made me feel old. <laughs> We're not the same age. <laughs> Many of you may know that Dr. Russell started as a teacher right here in District 58. He went on to leadership roles in various districts, including his tenure as superintendent in Chicago Ridge. He has consistently exemplified a profound commitment to the betterment of our schools and the success of our students. His contributions extend far beyond our district. He's an adjunct professor at the University of St. Francis. He's an active participant in educational organizations such as the Superintendent's Roundtable for Northern Illinois. And he's very active here in Downers Grove amongst many organizations as well. Your dedication to lifelong learning and your passion for sharing your expertise has been undoubtedly left a lasting impression on countless educators and students alike. This is why your colleagues recognized you for your leadership, communication, professionalism, and community involvement. Being named a superintendent of distinction for this region is impressive. There are 42 school districts, 256 schools, and nearly a million people in DuPage County. There are 800 superintendents across the state, and you have been elevated this year to one of 21 leaders who model excellence and inspire their peers. And my math tells me that's the top 3%. <laughs> Now, Dr. Russell will officially be honored at the, by the IASA at a ceremony uh, in April in Springfield, so we're excited for you to go down there. And I just want to state that the District 58 community is so fortunate to have Dr. Russell with us for these last few years. I, I don't think many of you, we were just talking beforehand about how many weird things come across at administrator's <laughs> desk. Over the years, he's become an expert in commercial real estate health and infectious diseases, <laughs> referendums, strategic planning, and many of you may know that he's our resident meteorologist as well. <laughs> so Kevin, the district has continued to flourish under your leadership. We're so grateful that you're here. And I just want everyone to please join me in applauding Dr. Russell and wishing him continued success in his future endeavors. Thank you very much. That was unexpected. They usually can't sneak anything by me in the school board meeting, but they did it tonight. So uh, I really appreciate that. But um, you know, the credit starts with the Board of Education, our excellent team of administrators, our unbelievable staff, and our wonderful students and families. I am very honored and humbled uh, to be the superintendent of District 58. If I have it my way, this will be my last superintendency. I really do enjoy being the superintendent here, and I can't thank the community enough for their support. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so now I'd like to welcome up uh, the principal of Whittier School, Michael Krugman. 
Thank you very much, and congratulations, Dr. Russell, again. Um, I would like to introduce our student council. Uh, Mr. Eric Miller is uh, one of our student council advisors, and we've got three of our student council members today who are going to share some information regarding student council. of the Whittier School Student Council. Thank you for inviting us this evening to share a little bit about what we do at Whittier. All right, like Mr. Krugman said, my name is um, Eric Miller. I'm one of the two staff sponsors of the Whittier Student Council, also a fourth grade teacher. Um, Jenna Smitley, the other fourth grade teacher, couldn't be here tonight, a little bit under the weather, but she's the other staff sponsor. And tonight we have Emma and Miles and Chase here to tell us all about the wonderful things going on at Whittier and Student Council. We love having fun and showing our school pride. Spirit is one, of, is one part of our role at Whittier. We usually have Spirit Days every Wednesday. So far this year we've had PJ Day, Crazy Hair Day, Yoga Day, Multiples Day, Dress Like an Older Person Day, Fancy Day, and many more. Here's a photo from our dress like an old person day. <laughs> <laughs> so this clothing is what is a huge part of our world at video. Providing aid to charities is always a focus each school year. Each year we run for office, we choose a charity to support. Our campaign speeches highlight our selected charity describing the help that is needed and how Whittier students can assist. These are charities that we were able to help so far this year. We collected canned goods for pads, sold smensels to raise money for St. Jude's Research Hospital, and we collected pop tabs for Ronald McDonald Charity House Drive. Bye. Finally, we honor with the Whittier teachers and staff during Teacher Appreciation Week. We look forward to providing them with something special this May. Thank you very much for letting us share about the Whittier Student Council. We are excited to plan most field days and community service projects for the remainder of the year. Thank you very much. As you can see, we've got a very enthusiastic student council group, uh, and they do a fabulous job creating spirit uh, throughout our building. At this time, I would like to introduce another uh, very important group, that's our PTA. So I have Britta Wazak and Christine Pollack, our co-presidents, uh, uh, to present on the PTA. Thank you for having us this evening. We just wanted to share uh, very briefly a couple things that the PTA has done this year and will continue to do this school year. Um, as Michael said, I'm Britta, this is Christine. A um, couple things, we were really excited to share that we earned the School of Excellence distinction this year. Um, one of nine Illinois schools received this for their PTA. Um, Whittier has made a commitment to provide opportunities that are safe, welcoming, and inclusive to the needs of all students, parents, and guardians, and staff. Um, so we have a banner hanging at the school for this. And then we also wanted to share that we received the Illinois PTA Gold Membership Award. Um, we've really been striving to up our membership to make sure that all families are included. Um, and so currently we have 219 members, which is over 89%, sorry, 80% of our families being represented in our PTA. Um, just to share a few things that we've been doing. Um, in the fall, we have ha brought our fun run back. Um, and so we'll do a 5K or one mile loop through the Randall Park community, which has been very fun. Uh, math and science nights twice a year. Um, one of our favorite events is the Whittier Variety Show, which we just recently had. Uh, many, many students show their talents off on the big stage at the Tivoli Theater, and kids work very hard um, to show off these talents. And, and then 
Also, Masterpiece of the Month is just one of the many ways we include parents to come into classrooms. Uh, they can come in once a month and share information about an artist uh, with the stu students of the classroom. Thanks, Britta. Uh, we also have a lot of fun going on at Whittier. We've got our fun fair that just happened with carnival themes at the school. It's a family event. And we have another upcoming family fun event uh, that's an all-family all ice skating. Um, we also have our bi-monthly fun lunch, of course. Uh, we have a butterfly garden now that has recently been qualified as a monarch way station. Um, many students are looking forward to watching that area grow. Um, our LEAP uh, mitten program it was, uh, I believe it was about 80 gifts and gift cards purchased um, to help families, help some of our families over the holidays. And we have a lot of after school clubs, including Spanish, theater, drawing, and chess club, along with our walking club during lunch, um, where kids like to earn bucks, with your bucks to spend at the, the shop. Um, so there's a lot going on at Whittier. And in line with our 23-24 goals for the PTA, uh, which include communicate, celebrate, and connect, um, our wonderful treasurer created this visual, Carol Avila, um, to, to share with everyone where our budget goes uh, this year. So as you can see here, we've got 13% going towards our organizational expenses, about 20% uh, towards school expenses, including staff appreciation and recognition. Um, but then the majority of the PTA funds, the budget for the year, do go to directly to our students at 67%, which covers our field trips, programs, assemblies, variety show, all those fun events that uh, take place. So thank you again for having us, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>so just a little snapshot to the fun that uh, we have at Whittier um, besides that we do uh, have a lot of learning taking place as well so I'm going to share some of that information with you this evening um, <clears throat> every year I challenge our staff and our students to a theme um, this year is no different this year our theme is change maker um, because we knew we'd have a lot of changes ahead um, of us uh, we are one of the phase one elementary schools so we've got a lot coming up in regards to change and how things are going to look um, in addition, you know, we, we knew, you know, every year change comes to us, you know, we're not stagnant, there's different things that happen throughout the year. And so I want to make sure that, that we all embrace change um, as we go through the year. I share with the staff and with the students, change can be good, scary, exciting, and challenging, uh, but change is inevitable if we want to continue to grow and progress. Um, and that is what we want to do throughout um, the seven years that the, that the kids are in our building. So when we look at our academic growth and our uh, achievement, we're very pleased at Whittier um, with the growth that we make throughout the year. Um, and we're looking at now our fall to winter uh, data. And overall, we've met our expected growth um, from fall to winter. And we're, we're very pleased about that and, and all of that we do um, you know, with our students. If we look in the area of mathematics specifically, um, you know, we celebrate that, that high uh, growth and that expected growth and then we review our lower than expected growth um, overall we're very pleased again like I said with with the improvements and with the growth that our students are making in reading again we met our expected growth again some high areas that we celebrate and then those lower than expected that we want to really look at um, we review our lower than expected growth as it relates to our school improvement plan and one of the areas of our school improvement plan this year is small group instruction. Um, our ILT, Instructional Leadership Team, looked at our data um, over the last couple years, and we really wanted to, to narrow down and see what can we focus on, what can we look at to try to increase our, our um, improvement and our growth. And that small group instruction was one of those areas. So as we review our data, that helps us move forward with our instructional decisions. 
we don't make a decision without looking at you know where are we and where do we want to be um, when we look then specifically at the details um, you know when we when we look at the, that low achievement we, w we want to you know try to figure out what is it that we need to you know really focus on we're pleased with our tier two and our tier three interventions and we feel that those are working what we want to do is continue to focus and strengthen our tier one curriculum implementation and that's what we've done over the last three um, professional learning Mondays. We've done our data analysis, our data teaming. Um, we started with our, our tier two and tier three interventions with our kids. And then we're, we really dug into that tier one curriculum. What, where are we looking at? You know, in, in our areas of reading here, um, you know, informational text, literary text, and vocabulary, those are those three areas um, that, that show some, some red and some orange that we really want to then focus on how can we strengthen what we're doing in our small group instruction to move some of that red and orange into the green and the blue so that we've got our kids really making that achievement that we want to see. We're continuously reviewing that small group instruction in all three of those areas. When we look at math, um, you know, the, the one grade level that we had a little bit lower achievement than we wanted was was fourth grade so again we look at those areas what can we do in that geometry measurement number and operations and operations and algebraic thinking to really s small in those orange and, and red numbers and, and increase those those green and blue and that's where we're really working with our staff on that tier one curriculum what can we do within that classroom for all students in order to move them and show them show more growth so with that, we, we developed the goals of our school improvement plan. Um, the first one with our English and language arts, and that's really where we looked at that small group and differentiated instruction. All of our st teachers do a great job with small group instruction, but some we saw achieving more than others. And so what we're doing now is we're diving into what's working when those classes that we're seeing more achievement than others. Um, we're all doing small group instruction, but we really want to look at you know focusing on the implementation, the structure of small group instruction, so that all kids are getting that same level of individualized um, assistance. Um, our ILT team is going in and doing observations. We're going in and helping the teachers then with how they've got their structure set up and how we feel maybe we can work it a little bit better. So throughout the year, that small group and differentiated instruction has been one major focus for us in the area of English and language arts. Throughout the district then, we've all increased um, and, and created a goal with the positive behavior support system. Um, we, we know that the, that social emotional piece is so important and that's where our student council comes in with all those fun activities, the spirit activities, the community support activities um, to really have the kids be ready to learn so that they can learn. Um, and so what we've done at, at Whittier is we've created our, our Jaguar jackpot. Um, and that we've, we've <coughs> centered around those district um, areas of be respectful, be responsible, be safe. And how are we teaching that to our kids and how are they showing us the importance of that? So through our PBSS um, Jaguar jackpot, at the beginning of the year, we looked at all of our expectations. Um, the teachers, we formed different teacher groups um, at those beginning institute days to really look at what is it we expect of our students in the classroom, in the lunchroom, in the bathroom, in specials, hallway, recess, to follow that be respectful, be responsible, be safe overall theme. So we've got these posters, all six of them are here on this slide, but each individual poster is in classrooms, in the lunchroom, in the bathroom. We revisit. We look at each one of these each month to see what do we need to focus on what can we really work on with our kids to get them really feeling good about themselves and feeling good about the school? By doing that, <clears throat> we've created our be respectful, be responsible, be safe monthly goal. And so each month, we set a, a um, goal for our students in how many Jaguar jackpot tickets they may um, be awarded. And if the entire building at the end of the month reaches that number, then we're able to have an all school reward. Besides that, we have weekly raffles for the kids. So the kids are looking at things on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis. And we're really focusing on those expectations. We've done be respectful, we've done be responsible, we've done safe. Be safe is sort of like a, an all year, um, 
all of them are all year, but be safe, we continue to revisit. This month, it's kindness. Um, this week is Random Act of Kindness Week. Um, and so the whole month, we're looking at some of those kindness activities. We do a daily um, um, Make Kindness the Norm challenge. And so kids will earn tickets if they're able to meet that challenge. This week, Random Act of Kindness Week, if the kids are showing some type of a random act of kindness that they get caught doing, they'll get a ticket. These are our Jaguar jackpot tickets that each of the grade levels um, are giving to the students. We put them in one big drawing, and at the end of the week, they um, can win one of our, our weekly raffles. Um, favorites are McDonald lunch for a student and a friend. Um, we've also had music during lunch as a raffle. Whatever classroom chose that, they got to put the, the, uh, the song list together for music during the lunch period. Um, Teachers enjoy an extra recess because uh, when their students win an extra recess, the kids get the recess and I do the supervision so the teachers get a little bit of a break as well. <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to make this work for everybody. Um, and the kids have really, really stepped it up. Um, they love the raffles. Um, they get excited about the raffles. Um, one of the raffles was uh, reading the morning announcements with me um, for a week. Uh, I traveled to each of the rooms to do morning announcements, and that student had a blast. And so now we've added that in as a, a regular incentive as well. Um, so we're really, really, really looking at what are the kids going to work for to show us those be respectful, be responsible, be safe, and now the be kind um, behaviors and expectations that we have. So we have really been pleased with the response of our students and just the enthusiasm. Um, we have a monthly assembly with all the kids, and they really get pumped up um, at, the, at those assemblies, and they really enjoy um, the activities that we have set for them. So that's been really, really positive. Our third goal is the writing um, curriculum. And uh, as we know, we've adopted a new writing curriculum this year, and so we want to make sure that all of our students are um, progressing through writing. We want to make sure that our teachers are, are teaching that curriculum with fidelity. Um, we had a really good grade level meeting today, and we really talked about that writing piece um, with, with our third grade team across the district. In, in each of the buildings, the administrators are going in to see what's happening in writing. And it is amazing, all the way down from kindergarten up to sixth grade, what our kids are writing and how they're responding to it. Um, I went in and I was observing in a kindergarten classroom, and they were doing um, a writing walk. And so all the students had their writing pieces and, and illustrations on the tables, and the other kindergarten students were walking around commenting on each other's writing pieces and, and each other's ideas. Um, it's just so neat to see them so involved in their writing. Um, I was in a third grade classroom, and they were <clears throat> it was selection day, so they had put all of their, their different <coughs> um, writings throughout the month um, together, and they were picking the one that they were going to move forward with. Um, and just again, the excitement that they have for writing um, has really, really sparked. Um, and so this, this new writing curriculum has really made a difference um, in the interest and at the level of what our students are doing in the area of writing. Um, it, it's just, it, it's exciting to see learning in action. It's exciting to see the fun, and it's exciting to see the learning. Um, and it's all happening at Whittier. As we look then at our professional development and, and how we're looking at those school improvement goals and how we look at our data, um, our model is to train, implement, and reflect on, on all of what we work on at Whittier. Our PLMs <coughs> are an awesome opportunity for us to have grade level and department analysis and collaboration. Um, developing those activities that we're going to be implementing within the classroom, and then analyzing our current progress and what we need to change or what we need to continue to work on because it's so good. Um, classroom observations, myself and our instructional leadership team going in and observing those small group and differentiated instructions, those writing lessons to provide feedback and let the teachers know what's working, what we're seeing that's really good in their classroom, and then some suggestions and ideas um, as they reflect and refine what they're doing. And then always our next steps are collaboration. Collaboration with our staff on progress, on changes, on improvements for the future, what's working now and what's going to continue to work in the future and what are we looking forward to. So that's Whittier in a nutshell. Um, the fun that we have, the, the service that we provide, and the learning that takes place. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to, to spotlight uh, Whittier to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here tonight for our student council members. We have a couple of gifts for you.
Thanks again. All right. That brings us up to our non-action reports. First up is communications. Listed on tonight's agenda are four communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? All right. Then we're going to move on to the spotlight on our schools. It's the winner data snapshot. So Liz Earhart, come on down. All right, good evening, board. Um, it was wonderful to listen to uh, Mr. Krugman share about Whittier. I am going to give you an analysis of all of our winter data in our winter um, data snapshot. So a little bit about tonight's objectives. We're going to provide a district level overview of our winter 2024 benchmarking data, review the ways in which these data points are discussed throughout the district. Um, Mr. Krugman shared several of those um, during his presentation as well. And then share an example of our response to data looking at both higher and lower than expected growth through our ACRA model. So the first thing we're going to do is just do a super quick review. This is something that we share in all of our spotlights, but I think it's important for the board um, to see and our community to see what our ECRA model um, provides to us. So what it does is takes our student achievement growth data, all of last year's performances, and then creates a individual student composite achievement score, their propensity score. Then they give us future projected scores, fall, winter, and spring. Those do not change based on the previous data point. So our scores from spring really do dictate what our fall scores will be or uh, expected to be, what our winter scores are expected to be, and what our spring scores are expected to be. Whether we see lower than expected growth or higher than expected growth in the fall does not change what the expected growth would be in the winter. So just something to keep in mind. Then we take our actual scores in fall, winter, and spring, and that determines what our growth is in our final um, growth analysis, which we um, share with the board in the, in the um, subsequent fall, but it is from our spring data. So additionally, our growth scores represent the difference between actual and expected achievement. So each deviation from zero indicates more or less than expected growth. That is represented through our ECRA reports in this model. So we do um, recognize that expected growth is indicated with um, a green dot. Higher than expected growth is indicated with a um, blue dot. And then lower than expected growth and unsatisfactory growth are represented with both yellow and red. So a little bit about our winter growth summary. These are the data points that we look at. It's a little small to see, but in kindergarten and first grade, we take a look at our Ames web data as well as our map data. And then in second through eighth grade, we are looking specifically at our map data. Our winter data really is that midpoint check where we see the progress that we are making. We make determinations of if things are going well, are we staying the course, or if we're seeing lower than expected growth, or maybe um, some areas that, that we want to see improvement, what are some of those courses that we're going to change in order to get to our spring expectations? So as we look at our overall winter data impressions, the results show that district level growth is in the expected range for both reading and math. When we're viewing results by grade level, and I'll go into more detail and show the graphs um, after this slide, math growth is higher than expected in kindergarten and grade three. Math growth is lower than expected for grades seven and eight. When we review results by grade, our reading growth saw increases across multiple grade levels, which is really exciting to see. And then reading growth was lower than expected in grade five. Grade eight saw an increase in their growth from fall to winter. So you may see that there is um, a, a lower than expected growth, but we did see an increase in their growth measures. So we wanna see those going in that same direction. So as we look at um, our winter growth summary for all subject areas. So this combines all of our schools and it shows their both math and reading. We saw expected growth across the board at all 13 of our schools. So that is really just some positive data, things to celebrate <coughs> and um, ways that we want to um, ensure that we are, we are showing growth and it is in that expected range. So we're gonna take a little bit of a different approach for this particular um, data snapshot. Typically I would show both schools math then, or all the schools math then reading, then I would show the grade levels math then reading. 
uh, for um, this particular data snapshot, I did want to show math and consistency and show where some of those areas are that we're making um, changes and improvements in, but then and then go into the reading. So you will see a little bit different than the way that it's presented um, in, or that it, I presented in the fall. So when we look at our mathematics, we are seeing that we have a few schools that have higher than expected growth. Um, that is, again, all of their students K-6 at the elementary level, and then all of seventh and eighth grade at our middle <coughs> schools. So we do see some variation at specific schools within grade levels, but this is, again, their overall population. We do see at our middle schools that there is lower than expected growth in mathematics. Um, this is a consistent, um, trend that we have seen but again as I said we did see some um, improvements in this area so while it's not where we want it to be we are seeing some movement in the right direction when we look at grade levels it is the same um, type of data point where we see kindergarten and third grade with that higher than expected growth um, and then we see our seventh and eighth grade which would be consistent with the school-based data in that lower than expected with everyone else in that expected range and then additionally our subgroups this is an area that we dive into and we look to see where our subgroups are landing all within that expected growth range So I did wanna just dive into the data a little bit with you and show you what we look at when we um, analyze our data as a school, as a district, or as a team of teachers. This is the scatter plot that um, populates in our ECRA dashboard. Um, and each of those dots represents one or more students and where they land on our growth model. So what we can do with this type of data is really dive into who are the students that are falling below what we call that river. So in between the two blue lines is that river. And those are the students that fall within our expected growth. Who are those students that are below the expected growth, both lower achieving and higher achieving? And how can we make plans in order to increase that achievement level? Who are those students that are above that river who are showing us higher than expected growth? Are we doing anything different for those students and what can we do to replicate that as well? And then our students within the river are our students meeting our growth expectations. Are there any students within those groups that um, we are currently providing intervention service to? Is that, go is that working well? Do we need to continue those services? Do we wanna pull back a little bit? Um, something that isn't represented particularly in this picture is a sidebar that also allows us to navigate subgroups and, and different um, specifics about a student's score. So this is our seventh grade data. And then I shared as well our eighth grade data. So again, the middle school math data is where we did see lower than expected growth. So I did wanna share with you some of our action plans. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about what are we doing in order to make this um, action happen so that we can have um, typical growth or our hope is higher than expected growth. So right now what we're doing is we're reviewing our guaranteed and viable curriculum process. One of the things that we cannot do is say that we know exactly what's causing lower than expected growth if we don't have everyone on the same page in teaching and moving in the same direction. So we are going to go through um, a curricular review process for our middle school math and just make sure that everyone is moving in the same direction and using resources that are aligned to what our expectations are and what our standards are. Additionally, we're creating um, and using common assessments across classes and buildings. So this is something that across a building you would see um, common assessments, but we did see some variation between O'Neill and Herrick, and it's something that we wanted to address. So we are in the process of creating those common assessments to ensure that we're assessing the students on the um, standards that we are teaching and that those um, assessments are aligned to what our expectations are. Additionally, we are working on consistent intervention processes for our students. So this is something that's really important when we're looking at our students who maybe are falling into tier two and tier three and in need of services. We want to make sure that we're providing interventions that are research based and are giving us the most bang for our buck. We want to make sure that our students are successful. So ensuring that consistent intervention processes are happening in our math classrooms. And then additionally, reviewing and implementing our professional learning. So what have we provided for our math department in the past? What are some future professional learning opportunities we can give them during our PLM time? And then what are past um, professional learning 
um, uh, activities that we have provided to our math department and how can we ensure that we are following some of those um, processes as well. So these are all things that are happening throughout our PLM schedule. We're working closely with um, our middle school principals and assistant principals as well as the curriculum department to ensure that this is one of our main areas of focus. If you just had to oh, kind of pause and reflect, right, those are four pretty big areas that are part of the action plans yeah. Yeah, curriculum assessments interventions and professional learning yeah where do you think we move the needle like which one of those fours has the most opportunity for us to be perfectly honest, I really think it's that first one, making sure that we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum that are following our standards and we're using um, research-based materials that are really going to, to help our students. So really looking at that tier one because that's meeting the needs of the bulk of our students and making sure that we're following that with integrity um, and then going into the common assessments that are provided. To piggyback off of that, I would have selected the same one as well. Um, when we were having similar numbers uh, a couple of years ago in middle school English language arts, mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest things that we did was we got all the group together. We had people doing a lot of really good work, but it might not have been consistent across the board in terms of um, you know assessments or delivering instruction. One of the things that we saw really move the needle with English language arts at the middle school is when not only our teams at O'Neill and Herrick got on the same page, respectively, but when we got on the same page as the district and, and really started to take a look at what are those key standards in each grade level that we want students to be able to consistently perform on. And so we did see the needle move significantly in that area. We believe we can do the same thing here at, in mathematics and, and we're well on our way, especially with those common assessments. But I would agree with Liz that number one, um, if you don't have that guaranteed and viable curriculum across all classrooms, grade levels, schools, uh, that's where you're going to start to see some inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So in addition to looking at where are some areas that we want to see improvement, we also want to look at where are some of our areas that we see higher than expected growth and how can we replicate that. So here is a look at our third grade math data where we see several of those dots that represent our students above that line and not so many that are below that blue line. So it's something to really just keep in mind as um, we talk about how teachers navigate data. This is really what they're looking at and they're able to pinpoint specific students students and groupings that um, really are going to show success. So when we look at this data, we want to make a, a determination of how do we review it and how do we replicate it. So one thing that we do know is that when we are building student strategies based on their prior knowledge, a lot of number sense happening right now in our primary um, grades is really showing and evident in our third grade um, instruction and in, in what our third grade students are producing for us, which is really fantastic. I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about that small group instruction model. We see a lot of really strong small group instruction models where if a student group is maybe lacking in some number sense, this is the grade level where we see that push to get some of those basic skills down so that as they're going into their multiplication and division and then further into the year into fractions um, they are able to lend that number sense knowledge into that future teaching this is also that initial grade level for acceleration so that's really an interesting um, piece to look at so we're going to continue reviewing that data and supporting our acceleration process we have a really great process in place we're actually starting all of that data review right now um, and, and working through our, our process with um, the technology department and with the curriculum department so we're really excited about what our tech, um, acceleration process looks like for our students Now we're going to move into reading, and I, I do want to piggyback a little bit on what um, Dr. Russell said about the middle school um, ELA scores or reading scores. That is a place that we saw a, a growth from fall to winter, and right now we're in the middle of a pilot. Um, you're, you are going to hear about our pilot experience um, at the curriculum workshop on March 4th, but we have all of our middle school ELA teachers participating in that pilot, and the growth that we've seen from the students based on using a common resource and really having common assessments and common exposure to standards um, has, has really um, been such an improvement within um, those grade levels. 
So additionally, we have our grade level data. So we did see um, a little bit of an anomaly here with our fifth grade. It's nothing that um, was overly um, apparent and, and we did a little bit of research on, on some schools. So we have our, our coaches and our curriculum <coughs> coordinators kind of working through where are some of the, the schools and, um, and grade levels, specifically in fifth grade, that we may want to have some <coughs> additional support in our PLMs. And then again, we did see um, all of our subgroups make that growth. So when we look at our next steps in data analysis and school improvement, here are a couple of bullet points that I wanna share with you. So our building teams have met the past couple of weeks by grade level to review our winter data. They are using ECRA, getting more and more familiar with the platform. This is an area that we want to continue growing as we are all learning all of the nuances and all the buttons that you can click in order to filter students and filter subgroups. It's really important that everyone has access to that information at a school level. That tier one data is reviewed to see whether winter data encourages us to stay the course or to make an instructional adjustments overall as a grade level or a content area team. And then we take that deeper dive into student data, including classroom assessments, adjustments to instruction, and additional professional learning opportunities, which are some of the many ways that we respond to the data that we see. So we do take our, our map data and our ECRO reports and, and analyze them, but we also look at some of those classroom assessments and make sure that our day-to-day -day instruction is also showing growth for our students within their classroom assessments. Additionally, individual students continue to be identified for specific targeted support. They pro their, their progress sorry, is monitored um, on a regular basis, and then we determine if intervention is still a warranted or a needed um, part of their day. But what we really want to um, keep focus on specifically when we're looking at ECRA is where is our tier one instruction? That is going to be the biggest um, change agent for our student um, achievement, is that our tier one instruction is meeting the needs of all of our students. The winter data is also gathered to begin that eligibility determination for acceleration and gifted programming, which is something that I shared with you. Um, so we are in the um, beginning stages of that process. So again, we'll just take a little look or a, a quick look at when our next data reviews will be. So in June of 2024, we will have our spring data snapshots. So I will share similar information with you, specifically about AmesWeb and MAP. In August of 2024, the ILT teams at each school will review their overall growth, which will include IAR data for th grades three through eight, and they will start making plans for next year's school improvement plans and the goals that they wanna set. And then in October of 2024, at the Board of Education meeting, we'll do our fall data snapshot, and those will have our um, final KPI analysis for this um, particular school year. And then we go into our um, spring summative data, and then also our um, school report cards. So we're already looking at October and November of next year. So any questions? Questions or comments from the board? I guess, how, how can we support, right? We, we, yeah. we come here every few months to talk about seventh and eighth grade, and looks like we're making Absolutely. progress. And I, honestly, that's the first time I've seen that phrase, guaranteed and viable curriculum. Absolutely. So, I, so we're talking about time and mm -hmm. opportunity, basically, for the students to kind of standardize Absolutely. So the, the, some of the first steps, that's a great question. So some of the first steps that we will do is take the math um, department and go through what is our curriculum review process. So similar to what we just did with ELA, we'll do that a little bit early with our middle school math. The, um, if I'm correct, the math adoption happened right before COVID. Um, hit so there maybe was a little bit of variation as we tried to um, and move to online learning and maybe there were some areas where um, we kind of you know maybe went off track on some of the the way that we were presenting material to students so it's really just getting everybody back on that same page and ensure that they are following the resources that we have available um, and then that through that guaranteed and viable curriculum and curriculum review process, we will make a determination if we wanna stick with the resources we have. If that's the decision that is made through that process, then we'll just continue some more intensive professional learning, which will happen during institute days, professional learning Mondays, and make sure that we're really honing in that focus. I was interested to hear the, 
the importance of curriculum among the four areas that we're going to be investing. Yeah. And I wonder what tools or opportunities do we have to uh, identify like implementation fidelity and monitor that without being too big brothery with our wonderful educators. And so love your perspective on yeah. how, how might we do that with a 5,000 student district. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I would hope that our staff knows that any time that we're looking at implementation and um, access to curriculum, that we're doing it from a lens that we want growth and we want to see them be successful and we want to see our students be successful. So always as a place of coaching and support versus saying we're not doing something or something is going um, awry. So we want to make sure that we are supportive of our educators, which then in turn shows support for our students as well. Um, when we look at the student um, experience, again, we want to make sure that our students have access to the same education across our schools and across the board. So really making sure that the supports that we're providing and the curriculum that um, that is being shared with our students, the way that we review that is through um, surveys. We observe, we have our coaches go in and do coaching cycles with our teachers to make sure that we're able again to support, but then we're also seeing that instruction happen in the classroom. And then that's something that we really um, do expect that our, that our building leaders are also um, monitoring and ensuring that, that the instruction is happening according to what our plan is and what our curriculum maps show. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. The other yeah. question that I was wondering is as we think about our strategic plan KPIs, yes. is the June space or is it the August space that we'll have a sense of how are we tracking against those KPIs? So we'll be in the fall because we'll wait until all of our IAR data oh, yeah. is okay. included. And that's the one thing that's always interesting when we do these mid-year checks on our data. Our mid-year checks are really only using MAP, but then in the spring we incorporate that IAR data for our final review process. So it is interesting because our student achievement in um, state assessments is continuing to increase and increase. So we want to make sure that we're staying that course as well and not trying to overcorrect too much on MAP, which is kind of showing that growth model. I was wondering if we have a sense of, sometimes we, we get frustrated in education by IAR data not coming until October. Yeah. And so I wonder, is there an opportunity <coughs> through winter or through our spring data to get a sense of how are we doing against those KPIs? Do we need to wait until our October space to see those final results? I think we can use some preliminary data that we have, but it's not necessarily, re necessarily released where we would share it in, in public space. Yeah. Yeah, the only issue, um, we certainly get prelim data as Liz was sharing. We get that typically in, in June, some years it's come a little bit later. And so that is the work that we'll start doing right away. So as we meet with our principals for their uh, beginning of the year goals and their IRT, by the time we have that second IRT meeting in the summertime, we have that uh, preliminary data available to us where we can start looking at it. Um, in terms of being able to share that publicly, we can't share that until the embargo is lifted, um, but we are certainly still looking at that data and, and using that um, for instructional purposes. And that's one of the pushes that we're really trying to work hard with ISBE and the new state superintendent on. If you truly want us to use this assessment for instruction, you have to get this data back to us on time where we can actually make some formative decisions. Um, and so by them releasing that um, initial data out to us, it does allow us to do that a little bit. Absolutely. Any, Any other questions or comments? Just one more comment for the board. Um, Steve, I really appreciate that question that you asked. I think as Liz demonstrated today, when we get data, we can immediately meet with our teams through PLMs. Um, Professional Learning Monday, I recognize the, the challenges that that poses getting out at, at 2 o'clock or 2.15 for our middle school students, but it is invaluable for us to be able to go and meet with our teachers and to, to hear what concerns they have or, or what they're seeing uh, as a success. You know, just today we were meeting with, with middle school math and, and being able to turn that around so quickly. So that support from the Board of Education is very much appreciated. I know that we'll review PLMs later on at the, uh, the April and May board meeting, but that is something that is um, extremely helpful to us to be able to react and um, respond. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that brings us to reports to the board. First up is the superintendent report, Dr. Russell. Thank you very much. Um, 
can't believe we're already at February, two days away from Valentine's Day, but uh, here we go. Um, uh, first off, I want to thank the Whittier PTA. Christine, I know yeah, you did a nice job, and uh, Michael, you as well. Uh, great things are taking place at Whittier. It's always a fun school to go and visit, uh, just to see the enjoyment on the kids, and such a great uh, group of families who are really involved in the school. So uh, we thank you for that. We don't take that for granted, uh, but it is a, a wonderful school, and uh, we enjoy it very much. So thank you for being here tonight. In terms of curriculum instruction, we just wanted to update the board and community about the band and orchestra solo fest that uh, was held this weekend. It was a huge success. More than 400 solos were performed at the event. When you think about that number, I, I kind of read that twice uh, when Liz gave it to me. It just shows you the power of the instrumental music department in Downers Grove and how talented of students we have. So we are uh, extremely uh, grateful for all the families that make that happen. And uh, just to have that many kids on a Saturday is, uh, you know, just phenomenal. Another thing that's coming up on uh, February 26th at Downers Grove South is the Festival of Music. Uh, it's one of my favorite nights of the year. It's where uh, O'Neill and orchestra, their band, their choir, and um, their orchestras get together and they perform at Downers Grove South in a combined uh, performance. It, it, it's a very powerful night. A lot of fun and we fill up the auditorium at the high school, which is hard to do. Those are pretty big. So it's another uh, sign that not only do our kids start in these programs, but they finish all the way through the, in the programs. And then on March 4th, we'll hold our curriculum workshop. At the workshop, you will hear a review of the ELA pilot experience. You'll see staff presentations and we'll receive updates on many of our district committees. And so um, I think, Liz, that was your first night here last year. Uh, we got you ready for that. So you're on your own this year, but uh, we're looking forward to that. In terms of finance, we recently received our final report from the DuPage County Treasurer's Office uh, from 22 payable to 23 taxes. We're proud to report, uh, I'm fortunate that we live in DuPage County because we had about 99% collection rates, which is very good. Just want to put this on everyone's radar. It is a reassessment year, and with reassessments for the county usually come a lot of tax appeals. So that could cause a delay in when bills are sent out and then when tax payments are received. That is obviously something that we monitor uh, very closely. As I shared with the FAC, it's not keeping me up yet at night, but uh, something that we're still uh, watching. Uh, the reason why is as we get closer toward the end of the fiscal year, we really do rely on those tax payments uh, because that is one of our low cash points of the year. As Todd always reminds me, um, many of the families in DuPage will escrow their mortgages and so the banks will go ahead and automatically uh, pay those as quickly as possible, but still something um, that we want to closely monitor. When I was a superintendent in Cook County, they were notorious for um, not paying on time and it really can wreak havoc on a school district budget. And so we'll continue to monitor that, continue to seek updates from our assessor's offices and um, stay in touch if it is going to turn a different way. In terms of technology, technology department is busy finalizing registration. I want to thank James. Um, we always have a million questions for James. What if we put this in registration? What if we put that in registration? And James always makes it happen, so we're very glad uh, for that. Believe it or not, registration is going to open up uh, toward the end of this month. I know James and his team are working very hard on that. And then we're hoping to close that in April. Why do we want to do that a little earlier? Uh, we found a lot of success, especially with our staffing models. The sooner we do that, the more that we can predict what next year is going to look like from a staffing perspective. And with staffing being such a big part of the budget, it really does help us make uh, some of those financial decisions. So thank you to James, and I know Faith Bear plays a big role in that as well. So thank you to Faith for uh, all your work with registration. In terms of personnel, uh, speaking of registration, the beginning of registration season also marks the time of the year when we begin to focus on staffing decisions for next year. The March board meeting, Justin will provide a very high level overview of what we're looking at, um, knowing that registration is a critical component of the final numbers. But uh, Justin is preparing that report. Then we'll come back at the end of the year, usually the May or June meeting, and let you know officially where we're landing. And then, of course, come back at the start of the school year and let you know where all the numbers uh, shook out as we get all the move-ins and the final enrollment. So thank you again, uh, Justin. Uh, he's really doing a nice job uh, balancing class size targets and student support needs with the realistic constraints of our budget each year. We look forward to sharing more in the coming months. Special Services, District 58 looks forward to offering extended school year <coughs> programming to eligible students with disabilities. Students who qualify for extended school year ESY through their IEP will receive a direct invitation and more information on this program uh, in the, from the child's case manager. Dates for the program will be June 4th through July 2nd. That seems like a very long way away, uh, but it is actually right around the corner. 
terms of facilities, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be opening up bids for both elementary and middle school construction projects. Bid group three for the phase one elementary schools will be opened this week and be presented for approval at the March 4th special meeting. So it is a curricular workshop, but we are also going to seek uh, some approvals at that one uh, so we can get going on a lot of our bids. Middle school bid group three will be open later this month and presented at the March 11th regular meeting. So elementary schools will be on the 4th, next round for middle schools will be on the 11th. Results of these bid openings will increase our budget allocation from approximately 48% right now to 67% of the entire referendum project. So things are really moving along here. Uh, we would like to thank our neighbors next to O'Neill Middle School. Starting at spring break, we will lose 70 parking spaces on the O'Neill site. However, the YMCA has graciously agreed to allow our staff to park in their lot until the new parking lot is in place. So we cannot thank the YMCA enough. I want to thank Tom and Kevin Bardo for really uh, going over the lie, working with them. Um, they've been great partners here uh, with us at O'Neill Middle School, and this is really helping us out. And so we're uh, very ecstatic that they allowed us to use their parking lot. So we do not have to create a temporary lot or anything and take up more of the field. So uh, very happy about that. In terms of public relations, really just putting on everyone's radar, it's survey season. Uh, we have the five essential survey that is primarily used for our uh, students and staff. They'll be taking those. Uh, the window closes at the end of March. And then also our climate survey that we send out to all of our families and we review that data here at the board meeting a um, little later on in the spring and summer. That climate survey is a reminder. We'll talk, uh, we'll send it out to individual schools and families will be able to share uh, their experiences at the individual schools. And then we look at that uh, obviously the aggregate as a district as well and we've got several years worth of climate survey data to compare to to see how we're doing uh, based off of previous years okay under other I just want to take a moment and say thank you to our families our staff members and especially our students January was an extraordinary month in terms of weather. I know Darren joked that I was a meteorologist. <laughs> That's one job I can't wait to give up. Uh, <laughs> those stressful nights. And um, I, I want to say a couple of things. First off, um, we have a, a very solid e-learning plan. And I think our staff executed our e-learning plan all three days extremely well. I couldn't be prouder of them. They worked very hard. They did a nice job with that. And I have no doubt they'll continue to answer uh, the bell every time we have a date like that. The other reality, though, with e-learning that I want to recognize is we're an elementary district, and it is challenging, especially for our younger students um, and students with special needs. Um, it is not the same as being in school on those particular days. And I also want to recognize um, some of the hardships that I know our families encounter on these particular days when we go remote. Um, a lot of families still have to work. They have two working families and so you're, or two working parents, so you're at home trying to work and your children are trying to do e learning. I think we all experienced that during the pandemic. It can be very challenging, especially if you have a job that doesn't really allow you to, to do that. So we recognize that from our families as well. And just overall, I want to thank everyone. I think our teachers did a great job. But, you know, um, I also want to recognize that e-learning is not always uh, what it's cracked up to be sometimes. And uh, that is not a knock against our staff, again, or our students. They did a great job. But certainly by the time we got to the third day, we started to hear uh, a little bit more about the hardships that e-learning uh, causes. Um, I wish I could control the weather. I will try and do a better job at that. But in the interim, um, we're going to continue to work with our families. During construction, we really don't have the opportunity to extend into the summers because we need those precious days. However, our e-learning plan is up for review. We'll be bringing that to you this summer. Liz is working on that. You have to renew that every three years. And then post-construction, um, as I've shared with many community members, we'll continue to have conversations about e-learning. When is it appropriate? When is it appropriate to take you know, a traditional snow day or something like that? And I look forward to uh, those conversations. With that, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. Um, later on in the agenda, we're going to be voting on the consent agenda, the constructive consent agenda, and I had a question about that. <laughs> um, if you look at the documents for Herrick and O'Neill separately, um, they both have a line for lump sum general condition staffing. Um, Herrick's number is about 2.02 million, and O'Neill's is 1.95 million. Can you tell me um, of those two numbers? Is that are those complete? Is there any um, 
Is there any duplicity there or redundancy, or is that all? Is that all? Um, this is what one building costs is what the other building costs, or is there, is there some overlap there? Is so difference? primarily, you're exactly correct. Herrick is going to be a larger amount simply because there's more work at Herrick. It requires more staff. So that staffing number that you would see built in there, those are for specific people that are going to be doing specific jobs on that specific site. So for instance, embedded in there is the cost of a superintendent, not an uh, education superintendent, a uh, construction superintendent. You will have one at Herrick, and you will have one at O'Neill. Um, one of the reasons, again, Herrick is a little bit more simply because um, you have more work that's going to be uh, taking place over at Herrick. It's going to require more staff. Um, there are some shared costs in that, but when we share those costs, so for instance, there's a, a person named Ben Steele who oversees everything uh, for both projects. The cost of his salary actually gets divided on a prorated basis. So it might be 45% for um, O'Neill. 55% for Herrick because Herrick's going to require a little bit uh, more time. But we do not mingle those together. Those are our, our separate uh, sites. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. That brings us now to the um, monthly business and treasurer's report. Todd Drayfall. Good evening. Uh, because of the very quick turnaround in the January board meeting, as uh, we noted back in January, you know, we didn't have a year-to-date treasurer's report, so you'll have two this month, uh, both from the end of January and the end of February. I'm sorry, the end of January and the end of December. Um, difference, uh, everything's running along according to you know, uh, expectations. Uh, we did uh, complete uh, the second quarter reports for expenditures for fe uh, federal funds uh, they were able to so we completed those and we had federal money come in so you see a differential in revenue on the federal side uh, between end of December and the end of January uh, and there's that chunk as well as um, uh, the state did a distribution of uh, transportation funds uh, you know and some of the categoricals as well um, we are now into the um, time of the year where uh, expenditures will, on a month-to-month -month basis, exceed uh, revenue. Uh, that is because of the you know majority, forty-some percent of our revenue comes in in the last thirty days or so with that property tax piece, um, and so we were wait, you know we will wait for those. We still have money that comes in. Obviously, the state funding uh, those funds come in, and as well as we keep um, pushing through for for federal grants, but. You know, by and large, uh, we'll be in a position where we're uh, hitting away at the fund balance. That's why fund balance is such an important piece. Uh, questions on year-to-date or treasurer's reports? I wanted to take a few minutes um, to to review what uh, we have been talking, going through, and having conversations, particularly at the the financial advisory committee and. and uh, President Hughes probably when he gives an update on the uh, FAC meeting uh, we'll talk about this but we wanted to kind of quickly review for public um, where we're at with the food service structure because it feeds in and works with the capital piece uh, in our capital projects um, do I have the clicker <laughs> it's like James <laughs> uh, <clears throat> when we were Working through uh, preparing for the referendum, Citizens Task Force and other groups, uh, parents have always you know, come up and, and talked about uh, not having an elementary hot lunch program. It is somewhat um, unusual at this point uh, that many school districts do have uh, programs, uh, either prepackaged or, or in a hot lunch format. Uh, the district has not historically had one of those. September, we did some surveying uh, to see where people were at with this. Uh, we had a significant response uh, when we asked, one of the questions was asking how many students uh, re they represented, you know, if they had one student, two students, three students or more. Uh, conservatively, uh, that, that survey, according to the people as they responded, was about 2,300 uh, of our students. So, so a decent population. Uh, in 60, Six percent were interested in the program. Uh, the big motivation piece was, uh, you know, through that, and then through when we started the other uh, the pilot program, 
uh, the ease of you know the ease of ordering versus uh, making making a lunch uh, for those of us who are parents who have had to do that for a long time can understand and appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Eighty-six percent. I throw put this statistic in because it's an important piece when you're looking at um, need and and how a lunch program is going to be effective. And eighty-six percent. Uh, stated they had no dietary restrictions, uh, which is an important aspect as to how you can manage and build a program and, you know, and those type of things. As the board is aware, we went through and, and uh, at the end of October put in place a pilot program where we are offering um, on a weekly uh, that, that parents are allowed, can go in and pick a choice between two items. Uh, it is a national school lunch. It is a cold lunch, um, national school lunch based structure. It is a cold meal, uh, sandwich, uh, salad, whatever. Um, and, and that is available for them at, at a $4 piece. Uh, we then asked uh, for parents in December what was their, you know, what their thoughts were about the program. Were they in it? Were they not in it? Uh, we had a, a large Number start and then it, it kind of dwindled a little bit. It still is is there, and we still are working, you know, participating in and and doing that every day. Um, and we had a much smaller sample. It's December, and, and everyone is busy. Uh, but we had a, a smaller sample of, of that, and there still was a huge amount of people uh, that were in the program looking because of that ease of use. <coughs> The district is on a one-year bid for the National School Lunch, which requires us to go out for a bid this year. Uh, or as we use uh, this year in, uh, in the state, an RFP, a request for proposal. Uh, it has some actual uh, little flexibility in how we uh, are able to select and, and choose a vendor. Um, the FAC, the Financial Advisory Committee, the last several meetings uh, has been reviewing this. Actually, I think they started reviewing it last spring uh, as we started talking about this uh, this program as to the financial implications of staying on the national lunch program currently only the middle schools are on the national lunch program and we don't have a program at uh, at the elementary level uh, we have to we provide certainly for any student who is eligible and applies for a free or reduced lunch um, on that format um, we meet those needs uh, but you know we do not have applications under the lunch in an elementary format. Currently, we receive four cents per meal uh, on the elementary side for those for those meals that are are provided. Um, for the middle school, anyone on a free lunch, uh, we receive a four dollar twenty five cents from the federal government for that meal. Three eighty five for reduced, and even if we for any of those um, type A lunch. Structure we set we we get forty cents from the federal government. Um, so that was part of that financial piece, and uh, the FAC for the last couple of meetings worked through that process as to and and uh, our current vendor Quest Foods uh, provided some projections and some uh, we'll call them worst case scenarios because some of them were pretty big as far as uh, expenditures, but estimates as to cost and impact. Um, if the district left the National School Lunch Program and provided meals, also then they provided what the rate would be on the meal. Um, if we did not subsidize uh, the program um, and how it would look um, if we kept the middle school on an NSLP, did the elementary uh, not, vice versa of all or nothing. Um, the options, and this is something that will come to the board uh, in March, the March meeting, uh, as we're making steps moving forward, uh, is, is looking at, um, currently looking at the stat, going with the status quo of creating, of bidding out the middle schools on the National Lunch Program and continuing the elementary structure as is for the next year. That puts in a, a potential timeline um, and as I said, it's a, it's a great opportunity to do this and looking as given the construction structure that we have. The middle school kitchens are being built uh, in a, 
in a way so that they can support a satellite aid program um, and are built so that they're not simply heat and serve uh, programs, that there are uh, capacity to take raw meat product, cut it up, cook it, do things so that it's a fresher meal. Uh, they're designed that way, which is a big difference um, when you look at some places where it's really just huge ovens that they're going to heat you know, frozen food up. Uh, it makes a, a much different quality in food and, and you have more opportunities as well. But looking at this and going through the construction schedule, um, those kitchens, they break ground as we know, as we just talked about um, uh, for demolition at spring break with the fencing. Those additions are completed in the summer of 2025. The bids that will come to the board for to go out in the fall of 2024 for the summer of 25 will include <coughs> or scheduled to include any work that needs to be done to the elementary buildings to accommodate a, hunch, a hot lunch program. Some buildings may have very little to do like updating the sinks and updating some electrical to current standards, replacing some of the old equipment that's in there. Hen Henry Puffer had a program. It just needs to get some updating. Indian Trail has a you know a space that probably just needs a little electrical uh, and, and determination on some sinks and so forth. Other buildings are going to need more work. Um, other buildings have nothing. You know, we'll have to have a, a hand washing sink. We'll have to have some electrical updates. All of that will be in that package for all of the elementary buildings, um, regardless as to when the majority of their work is being done, whether it's this summer, next summer, or the summer after. Um, and then that would be completed by the summer of 2025. And now we take a look at the other side of this slide with the food service bid schedule. For the 2024-25 year, we're bringing to the board a recommendation at the March meeting uh, to continue the current structure as is. And then once we have determined through that regulated RFP process by the state um, who that winning contractor is, we would contract with them to do something similar in the format that we have currently with that contracting offering program at the elementaries. may look a little different. May We've learned some things as to what to do and how to adjust some things. Um, we have some buildings that one building specifically doesn't participate much at all, and so we'll probably want to have conversations about, you know, what's what's that working and how we can you know facilitate that um, but moving forward with that piece and then as we approach winter and spring of 25 preparing to go out because if we were to do a hot lunch program at all the elementary buildings um, that is a change and would require another rebid um, and so we would if that's the direction that we we're going to go uh, and that decision needs, you know, gets made, then we would go into that uh, process. We would certainly want to do that process much earlier. We would probably start that in December uh, with getting paperwork together and get that out on the street and much, you know, much earlier in the, in the cycle uh, in that year. And then we would be able to start the 25-26 year if the board so chooses and we choose to go in that direction with uh, an offering of a hot lunch program uh, K-8, um, currently the recommendation would be given the reimbursement structure and the level of, um, really, really level of our free reduced lunch count numbers uh, at elementary uh, to be on an NSLP format. Um, that has some other pieces to it and some decision making as far as fun lunch and adjustments and things. Um, what that did, what that will be, and how that works out um, is you know things that we need to work with, and we have time to, to go through and, and flush all of that out. Um, federal regulations require that you cannot compete against the national school lunch program. Uh, it doesn't mean that you know if you take a day and do something different, uh, and you make sure you provide uh, a meal for every student that is eligible for free reduced. You know that's still a possibility, but what that might turn to be is something that you know over that next year we will have time to, to
to sort out and, and have conversations with. That is, I think, in pretty much what uh, you, you've gotten the synopsis of you now two hours of FAC uh, committee meeting. <laughs> uh, and so questions and thoughts on that. Thank you, Ted. Mm -hmm. I also would just add if there's other things that you would like to see or have questions about um, as we put the recommendation together, please uh, let us know. I'll be glad to uh, make sure we can uh, answer those ahead of time. Just, again, one point of clarification. All that is happening next month at the board meeting is we are making a recommendation to continue middle school lunches in the format for next school year. Nothing changes for the elementary school next year. We wouldn't even have the services available at the elementary schools. Okay. Next year, we will then start to really dive into what can elementary school look like. And we will, of course, be working closely with our families, our PTAs, surveying people before we make any final recommendations. Um, so nothing is changing for elementary school next year. And based on the feedback we received, we'll present that to the board and the board will make the ultimate decision in terms of what it looks like in school year 25, uh, 26. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the policy committee has not met since the last board meeting, but the legislative committee has. You guys met on January the 10th. Uh, Member Hannes. Yes, so we had a busy January for legislative committee, gearing up for the legislative breakfast. So on the 10th we met um, just to kind of um, continue planning for the legislative breakfast and um, hone in on our question topics that we would have for the legislators and um, narrow down format and just all those kinds of details. And then we had our legislative breakfast on February 2nd which was excellent. Um, I think it was like record attendance this year for the breakfast. Mm -hmm. Almost 100 people came um, from the community and neighboring communities and legislators and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was a really, really well attended and great event. Um, I feel like it went off very smoothly. A lot of great conversations, discussions um, in the small group sessions, especially where community members were able to kind of um, you know, have, have back and forth open dialogue discussions with the legislators and talk about topics related to education that might be on their, um, you know, upcoming legislative agendas and sessions and things like that. And so I felt like it was just a really positive and, um, you know, inspiring time for people to be able to kind of touch base with those people who are making decisions for us that are going to affect obviously all of our students and staff and families related to education. So I thought it was great. Um, I don't know if anyone, Kevin or anyone who was at the breakfast wants to add anything, but uh, that, that wraps up the majority of the legislative committee's work for the year. It's kind of our big event and I thought it was great. So. And you know, just to follow up to the board, um, every legislator who came received a thank you card from the Board of Education or excuse me, a letter um, that we sent out. I want to thank Melissa for getting that out so quickly. And then Faith followed up with uh, surveys uh, to all attendees, and so we'll certainly share that information with the board mm -hmm. and the legislative committee. But I agree, Emily, it was a record-setting year and a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Melissa and Faith. They do so much work for that event, really putting so much time into pulling it together and making sure it goes off smoothly. So thank you guys so much. It was doesn't go unnoticed. We appreciate your, your hard work on that one for sure. And Emily, I just want to state that it, it was a very good event. Um, you guys kicked you and Melissa did a great job mm -hmm. and the way that it flowed we continue to focus on kind of a brief opening mm -hmm. and then a dialogue at our tables and I and I and there was some really good dialogue happening at our table and I could hear it around the, the other tables as well I, it is an opportunity um, I, I had a comment from one legislator that said uh, afterwards and she just made the comment to me like you know, that was a great conversation. I didn't think about the impact that this stuff could have down the line, and I, and I think that's powerful because um, some of these things sound great in when they're when they're having a discussion, when but they don't understand how it, it, it impacts us here on the ground. So thank you for continuing to put that together, and I thought it was a great format. Any comments or questions? All right. Thank you. The Financial Advisory Committee has met twice since. Um, our last meeting, we met on January the 12th, and we met on February the 9th. Um, I'll go a little bit over the, the lunch stuff as well, just from, uh, from a board member's perspective, but I will tell you that uh, the, the other aspects of the meetings, uh, Betsy Allen did come in from Miller Cooper and go over the audit with us, so we had an opportunity to review that. We did 
do that post when we had the meeting. Um, but that went uh, that went well. We had an opportunity to see the year to date report. Um, because we met the week after, so that one was ready and, and we were able to, to look at it uh, this week as well. We spent a little bit of time talking about those tax payments and our expectations in the reassessment year and some of the stuff that you heard um, earlier on in the superintendent's report. But over the last several meetings, specifically the last three, I really do want to take an opportunity to thank the Financial Advisory Committee because they're taking that advisory part of, of their title very, very seriously. And our meetings have not run an hour. Um, so we're probably looking, you mentioned two hours of, of summing up, it probably is, is over four uh, if we really, really look at the, the level of work that was going on. And so I really want to take an opportunity and, and thank them um, for that. The national school, the, the lunch program, uh, we wanted to do a lot of analysis and understand the impact that all of this was having on us financially, why people were liking this, why they weren't. Does the national school lunch program make sense for us? And I know that there are larger districts and high school districts that primarily focus on breaking away from that. It gives you a lot more choice in the, in the food in, that you're offering. But we pretty resoundingly heard um, that the portion size, the offerings that we have feel very appropriate um, for what we're offering. And the cost differential that it would take for us to leave the national school uh, lunch program just didn't make sense. However, we looked at every combination. National school lunch program for middle school, but not for grade school, and vice versa, both on, both off. Uh, both on makes the most amount of sense because of the numbers uh, that we have. We did a little bit of an analysis on what this is impacting us right now because we are running that program in this pilot. Those numbers look very skewed um, because it's, it's costing us, I mean, that projection that they put together was somewhere around $200,000 in impact cost. However, that doesn't take into account that the majority of those expenses are because we do not have a national school lunch program at our grade schools. So ultimately, the recommendation that's coming out, and Todd alluded to this, is that for right now, what you're going to get next month is a bid just to go out for the middle school lunches. Once we come out of that and we pick a winner, we can look at adding that same kind of pilot program for one more year. The good news, as you saw in that, our initial thought was it was going to be the 26-27 uh, school year that we were going to be able to add hot lunch to the grade schools, um, but we're actually going to be able to do that in the 25-26 school year because by that point we'll be able to get all those, the, those kitchens ready uh, to receive it. Now, just as a note, that might not mean that it's on the very, very first day of school because we'll just be implementing <laughs> that, um, but it would be that fall. So either way, we have to go out to bid this year because if you remember, they extended a lot of people's um, contracts. They let you keep just going out and just renewing with your same provider because of COVID. So kind of like that happened with driver's license, um, where they kept doing that. And, and there, yeah, and then there was a massive flood of people all coming at the same time. The same thing happened here. So they asked, especially with the change now that we don't have to take lowest bidder, they said, can you just go out for a one-year bid? So that's what we had to do. Now we have to do that again. Uh, we'd be allowed to extend this out five years, but if we want to add that other piece, and we have to, um, we have to go out the year afterwards. So, ultimately, what it's going to come down to is our recommendation. Most likely, will be that we'll recommend going hot lunch for everybody across the district, but being on the national school lunch program. That will actually, in the long run, save us money because of the expenses that we've been incurring. We're making four cents a lunch right now for all the ones that we have to provide, and. Um, so that would give us an opportunity to not only provide a better service to our students, but actually make it more cost effective in the long run. So it's actually, um, when we first started looking into this, we were like, what is that expense going to be? Um, and actually, probably in the long run, going to be more fiscally uh, responsible for us to actually implement a national school lunch program across the board. That will mean changes to the idea of fun lunch and stuff like that in the 25-26 school year. And we'll have to start, as we get closer to making a decision on that, that's something we'll have to start uh, communicating with uh, the, the PTAs on. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll go to Steve and say, is there anything major that I'm missing on either no, no. the school lunch program or the A lot programs? of great discussions, and I wasn't even part of them all, but I, I think uh, the advisory piece is, you know, underscore that, that's, that's critical. And, you know, anything we can do to kind of um, come to the table with, to that group, you know, 7 o'clock on Friday mornings with, with some more polished material. So I appreciate the, the executive summary here um, to kind of um, 
just kind of summarize the, the history of the, the how, the when, and the what to kind of get to this recommendation because I think it is something that if we kind of compare our district to others where we are lacking tremendously. So it'd be good to kind of close that gap in 2025. All right, any questions or comments from board members? Thank you. Then that brings us to the district leadership team. They have not met since the last board meeting, it says here. Um, the Health and Wellness Committee did meet on February the 5th, so I'll go to Vice President Harris. Yep, we met last week. Um, we, because we were so early in February, we didn't have any data from 2024 to look at yet, but uh, the January 1st is obviously an important date for our, our plans because that is the date when our, our new premiums take, in, uh, take effect. Um, so we didn't have anything yet, but we'll get that at the next meeting, obviously. Um, we did finish 2023 at a deficit, which is significant um, because that, that requires us to increase our payments, especially to, uh, we have four plans for all intents and purposes based on participation numbers. We have two. We have the universal plan and, and the HSA plan. Um, the, the universal plan had an 8% increase because of the size of the deficit from, from 2023. Um, another item on the agenda we, we did um, cover was looking at open enrollment. Again, that's something else that the board wants to, wants to keep an eye on because, like, like I just said, we have two plans. One of them has been performing very, very nicely over the past five years. That's the HSA plan. Uh, I think cumulatively it's gone up about a percent and a half in five years. Compare that to the um, universal plan, which has gone up over 25%. So just something to keep an eye on. It's always encouraging to see more people signing up for the HSA plan because, that, because it's been performing better. That's, that's um, offering great benefits for, um, for our, our employees and it, it is um, more affordable for the district and for the employees um, when it comes to looking at the premiums for that. Um, the biggest item on the agenda was looking at our wellness strategy. Um, this is something that we've, we have started, um, this is an investment we've, we've started in um, the last four or five years approximately. Um, we, we are, our, our, the consultancy we work with is Assured Partners. We, we heard from them about how um, our strategy has performed in the last few months. You know, we do encourage our, all of our staff and anybody who is on our plan to participate in our biometric screen, screenings. That gives us the data that we need to, well, that they need to help themselves make healthy choices. Um, for example, if you find out, you, you, do, you do the, um, you go through the screens, you find out maybe you're, you're, you're prehypertensive or maybe your cholesterol is bad. Well, then you can make some adjustments and then you, um, you will lead a healthier life. That's great for our employees. That's great for us. It's a win-win. So obviously there's, there's, there's an interest in, in incentivizing our staff to do that um, through financial incentives. Um, the Shared Partners is, is you know, recommending, and we'll, we'll continue to have these conversations as a committee, <coughs> they're recommending that we um, increase our incentives in order to um, elicit more participation. Um, my feedback is, as I'm not a member of the committee, I am the boards of the A's under the committee, I, I don't have voting rights on the committee, uh, but my, my feedback to the committee as, as this board's liaison was, um, we just need to. I just felt like we just need to have a little of a, a conversation around what our goals are because we look at some. We look at data points and we look at participation, which is about it's less than fifty percent. Um, we look at um, the risk. We look at a risk analysis and where where do our, our, our staff and where do the members of our plan fit? Um, are they low risk, medium risk, high risk? Where's the mobility between those those factors over the year? Um, but I guess my feedback was: Are we getting a return on our investment? this plan are, are we seeing participation that is driving um, our members to be to be making healthier choices um, and that's that is um, you know that's 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 what we really want we want to be making better decisions we want people who are, who are more healthy um, and, and happy so we just want to make sure that as we continue to to um, invest in this strategy that we are um, that that both the board and the employees who are who are contributing to the plan are seeing a return on their investment. Um, to add, Ty, anything to add to that? Or? No, I mean, uh, that was just the conversation. Yeah. Anything, um, any questions from the board? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, our last report here is the SASA report, Dr. Russell. Yeah, real quick on the SASA one, and Emily, please jump in. Um, 
we just had our first ever joint uh, meeting with the two new boards that we established last year. Emily represented uh, District 58 that night, and it's just nice to see how everything is coming together. Uh, the new executive director was there, as well as the uh, two interim directors as we get closer to the uh, end of the school year. What I'm seeing is just a really heightened sense of collaboration, uh, not only amongst the two boards, but with this asset administration and the partner districts. Um, we are in the process of reviewing a lot of the financials that go into that just to make sure that we have solid structures moving forward and that the member districts are getting what they're paying for, but also making sure that we're as efficient as possible. And so for an, an example of that, Todd and I are reviewing uh, Sunrise Transportation, taking a look at that to make sure that um, you know we are getting the best economy of scale along with uh, SASID and our students who participate in uh, SASID. But overall, uh, again, SASID continues to head in the right direction. Uh, we're excited for the future, but there's still a lot of work to be done until we uh, get to next school year. Emily, anything that I missed? Just to say, I hadn't been to a meeting since we kind of switched the structure, and it was really interesting to see. I feel like there's a noticeable improvement sort of in just the general functioning of the two boards and certainly a focus on budget and improvement and where can we um, find areas that we can make changes um, to how things are done, how districts are communicated with and build and all those different kinds of things that are beneficial for not only SASIT as an organization and its long-term success, but also for the individual member districts and obviously most importantly down the line then for the students who are taking part. So it was great. I thought the, um, the two you know current interim um, leaders that we have have done an amazing job and then it was great to meet the the incoming um you know superintendent of of sasset so I, I thought it was great it was really interesting to see and definitely it seems like sasset is on a um more positive path for than it has been the past couple of years so it was it was very enlightening and, and a great meeting i thought fantastic any questions or comments from the board all right thank you very much all right, we have no discussion items tonight, so that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended to be a time for members of the, uh, the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Um, the board has allotted 30 minutes tonight. We ask that you keep your comments to three minutes to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, I've received one card. Um, so I'm going to call uh, uh, Lou Avito. You want to step Oviedo. up? To yes. Oviedo. Oviedo? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to dedicate a couple of seconds of my time to say congratulations to Dr. Russell. Um, like many of you who volunteer in the community, the annual Oktoberfest by the Education Foundation, I've seen his special brand of uh, servant leadership firsthand. So thank you for your service. Um, it was also very nice to see the Whittier activities on display here today. Um, my name is Lou Oviedo, and uh, I've coached many a Whittier 5th uh, and 6th grade uh, Downers Grove League soccer players. Um, together, we've had the privilege for, for, for many years, together with Highland, Luster, and other parent coaches, um, the privilege of dedicating time to our students uh, and to the sport. Um, we've become very vested in seeing these girl student athletes develop and learn and grow in athletics. Um, I know many, if not all of you here today, watched the game last night. Um, more than any other year, it had the highest level of viewership from teen and preteen girls, <laughs> many of our daughters, my own. Um, and even if you didn't watch the game, I'm sure you've caught some of the commercials. The Dove soap commercial, the Hard Knocks commercial. Um, and the most salient point in that commercial was the data point that 45% of girls quit sports by the age of 14. Um, and so with that in mind, in November 23, when last year when you all voted to join the Southeast DuPage Elementary Athletic Association Conference, um, we, we, many of us parents commend that and, and we thank you for that decision. Um, it gives opportunities to many of our kids. Um, for the 2022 to 23 season, so this season, um, and for at least the prior 10 years, all 11 schools in the SDEAA SDEAA 
maintain girls and boys middle school soccer programs uh, and the same as anticipated for the 24-25 season. Um, I say that as a comparator. Um, Downers Grove, we understand, has been giving some serious thought um, to, uh, on multiple occasions to ensure that Herrick and O'Neill Middle Schools would foster and increase athletic offerings that ensure that soccer is offered as an organized school team sport um, for the 24-25 year. And so we're optimistic that that can become a reality. Um, many of the parents whose daughters we've coached uh, throughout various schools have a predicament that since Herrick and O'Neill are only two-year terms, a delay in offering soccer as a school program in middle school would uniquely deny the Donners Grove 58 students a significant number of parents and families from participating in the same in comparison to the other SDEAA schools who've had it for at least 10 years. <clears throat> soccer is unique. It allows high numbers of participation at various skill levels. It instills both physical and, uh, and character lessons that last a lifetime. It's a low cost of entry sport. Um, and most importantly, our Donners Grove community has a very strong foundational baseline in the sport. Um, I've spoken to the soccer, uh, the Downers Grove Park District soccer fields and program director who is supportive of efforts to build soccer into the middle school program. Um, I talked this morning to the Roadrunners Private Soccer Club um, who gave us statistics that their participation, which is broader than Downers Grove, but just to give you a sense, it's in the mid to high hundreds of families that participate in their programs for soccer. So the foundation is there built in. Um, and so together with all the coaches and parents and families, and most important, the student athletes, we commend and we applaud that DG58 is currently deliberating on whether to give effect to the decision to include girls and boys soccers for the middle school for 24-25 school year. We have, um, since I personally became involved in this effort, um, which is Friday, <laughs> our petition of parents and families is currently at, it's increasing every minute I check it, but I think we're at 30 families, close to 30 families currently, who are supportive of this. And so we request that you accept our willingness to work with you in bringing this to fruition. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to make public comment? Okay, that brings us on to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes for the January 8th, 2024 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the January 8th, 2024 regular meeting as presented. Next up is our cons consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis is absent. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We have a couple items up for recommendation. Um, press issuance uh, 113 policy updates. Is there a motion to adopt the policy updates and press issue 113 as presented in, by the policy committee? So moved. Second. All right, uh, is there any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to adapt the policy updates and press issue 113 is presented by the policy committee. We have some surplus equipment, including tables and a sprayer. Is there a motion to designate as surplus the equipment listed in the attached memo? Second. All right. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate as surplus the equipment listed in the attached memo. 
Next up is a resolution for the dismissal of a custodial maintenance employee for reasons other than the reduction in force. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution regarding dismissal of the custodial maintenance employee for reasons other than the reduction in force as presented? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution regarding the dismissal of a custodial maintenance employee for reasons other than reduction in force as presented. We have a, cons a construction consent agenda today. Is there a motion to approve the con construction consent agenda consisting of uh, the project authorization for Herrick Middle School, the project authorization for O'Neill Middle School, and Whittier Playground equipment? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The construction consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right. That's it. Except we got some announcements here. Uh, Monday, February the 26th at 3.45 p.m. will be the uh, next district leadership team meeting that will take place at O'Neill Middle School. On Monday, March 4th at 7 p.m. is the curriculum workshop at O'Neill Middle School. That date, um, remember, did change. So. Uh, Wednesday, March 6th at 3.45 p.m., the Legislative Committee will meet at O'Neill Middle School. On Friday, March 8th at 7 a.m. will be the next Financial Advisory Committee meeting, also at O'Neill Middle School. And on Monday, March 11th at 7 p.m., we'll be back here for our regular board meeting at Downers Grove Village Hall. All right, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to close to discuss? Just what? Uh, for the collective negotiation matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, it's 5 ILCS 122C2, and um, discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of the approval of the body of minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes is mandated by Section 2.06, that's 5 ILCS 122C21. All right, any discussion on that? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried. The board will now meet in closed session after a short recess. Let's meet at 845.